you talk about doing cartoons in high school. We had one up here, again, from the 1960 issue of the Baptist Students. Yes. My first national publication was in the Baptist Student magazine. I did this little series of uh, very influenced by, although not the drawing style was not, but the my sense of humor was very influenced by William. Uh, I don't know if it's pronounced as Steig or Stein, uh, but he would do these sort of little reflective comments rather than jokes, um, and that's a good thing to do uh, because then nobody can prove it's not funny. <laughs> but I did a series of those, and that was that got me in print. And this is one of my favorites here. Isn't he the cutest little teenager there? Oh, <laughs> this is your meeting when you were a luncheon guest with Milton Kniff. Yeah, I had a... Can you talk about that? I had a really unusual opportunity. I, I assume everybody, surely everyone's still familiar with Milton Kniff. Right? The creator of Steve Canyon, Gary and the Pirates, one of the uh, all-time great comic strip artists. Well, it turns out that the coach at the high school I mentioned uh, had previously been the next door neighbor to Milton Kniff uh, in New York. And so he became interested uh, in the fact that I was uh, wanting to be a cartoonist, and so he asked Milton Kniff if uh, he could take me along on a trip his basketball team was taking up to New England to be in a tournament. If he could drop me off in New York, I would stay uh, in the Y for two nights and uh, spend a day uh, or afternoon in the office in the studio of Milton Kniff chatting, and uh, this was a, just an astonishing opportunity, and uh, Kniff, as any of you know, I'm sure he must have surely shown up sometime or other at the uh, San Diego time in all the years it's existed, uh, but if you didn't ever get a chance to be around him, he was a very generous, very nice person, and uh, I always appreciate the fact that he was willing to spend time with me and let me watch him draw uh, Steve Gannon and, uh, and make a nuisance of myself. For a whole afternoon. And he also took me to lunch with the uh, president of uh, the editor-in-chief editor of King Features Syndicate uh, at Sardis, uh, which was a real trip for a rural Alabama boy. And uh, I ordered spaghetti because it was the only thing on the menu I recognized. <laughs> and uh, my uh, Sylvan Bike was the name of the editor at that time, and he had been shown my artwork, and he thought I was uh, talented enough to encourage. But uh, I, of course, went to that lunch thinking I was going to come away with a contract. Uh, but basically, and I, I was 16 at the time. And, uh, but I remember the comment that stuck with me was he said, uh, he said I was very talented, but he said, you know, this is the big leagues. And they don't just jump into the big leagues. And uh, so I was brought down to earth um, in a kind, but firm and white. Can we touch on that again, your influences at this time, your drawing? Oh, well, I went through all these various uh, influences over the years. I was very influenced by uh, the Little Lulu comics, uh, still my favorite comic book series ever. Uh, it went in its peak during the uh, 50s. Uh, I was influenced by uh, Al Castro Ladner a lot uh, for the Satire, uh, Crockett Johnson's Barnaby uh, was a big influence. You can see that in there for us. Uh, the um, uh, all of the mad artists, particularly uh, you know Jack Davis, Will Elder, uh, were big influences. Uh, at various times, I would latch on to you know artists. I think this is true of every cartoon. I think anybody who speaks here at this convention, if you ask for their influences, they'll him and Hall a little mention some names, and then if you catch them half an hour later, they'll say, oh, I should have mentioned, you know, and they'll think of 10 others who, for a while, were big, big influences. Now, you touched and you talked about uh, on your websites, uh, you said there's no way to overstate the impact on my life and Dr. Ronald Palmer. How? Oh. Oh, oh, sorry, I believe we have a picture of you here. This is probably what you're going to look like in about 20 years. Yes. So you're going to play. Why is he such a big influence? Well, I guess that would be best. Well, Frederick, you're in Knox to visit. And I was the professor who tries to get this evil, rich woman to not uh, make the town commit a murder. It's a long story. Anyway, uh, he changed my idea about what art was all about. Going in, growing up, wanting to be a newspaper cartoonist, 
my idea of success was popularity. Uh, I wanted to do something that a lot of people would like, enough people would like, that I would be able to make a living at it. And uh, Dr. Powell did very adventurous theater, far more adventurous than you would expect to find at a Birmingham uh, college. Drove Birmingham himself was crazy. Uh, but basically, he, just, he was very happy if the uh, people were, uh, the, the audience was left feeling disgruntled and amused and uh, had a lot of questions raised about their assumptions in life. And uh, you know, I realized that that's a far more substantive way to think about art. It's something that really stirs people up and gets into the back door of their consciousness, uh, and past their defenses. And comics is particularly a, a good form for doing that because it's an extremely accessible, it's a naturally accessible form. Most people respond to pictures. They don't have their guard up. If you give them a page full of text, uh, oftentimes it will look like it might be a lot of work to read all those words, and it looks just like every other page of text, and so there's nothing to really grab them and pull them in. Comics is, a, you know, it's a very friendly medium. And um, if you entertain them with ideas uh, that have some depth, uh, they'll find themselves thinking about those ideas while enjoying the pictures, and they won't even realize they've been, you know, kind in questioning their assumptions about life. And so, just cartooning and comics in particular became a, a much more interesting art form for me. But I brought into it a lot of the aesthetics that I picked up in theater. And I think you just the emphasis on dialogue in my comics, the emphasis on people talking uh, to one another, uh, uh, more so than action shots. I mean, I had to be car chase and fist fight cartoons. I had to have some violence in Stuck Over Baby, uh, and it was, uh, didn't come naturally for me. Uh, on the other hand, it was necessary. In Stuck Over Baby, I had to stretch myself in a lot of ways because it's, it's not my natural way of drawing. We almost lost you, to, as you can see in this picture, we almost lost you to the theater and TV. What, what's the deal on the well, Grady and Howard? Man? Yeah, well, one summer, the local educational, this was before PBS, so every little educational television station was on its own for content. And so they would ask uh, volunteers at the college if uh, they had any students who wanted to do programming of any sort uh, at the local educational thing. And so my friend Grady Parson and I, um, so I went down and talked to the lady who was the head producer, and we wound up with the Radiant Howard Show, which was a kid's show with uh, lots of stuff for any grown-ups who happened to tune in. I'm not sure if anybody tuned in. Fortunately, their, their ability to learn ratings was very slim, so we strongly suspected that about, you know, all of our college friends were watching and not many people. So what year is this again? This was 19... Uh, uh, 63. Because I'm thinking this is like Obi turning into Richie Cunningham there. You're looking on the right now. That's a good look here. Yeah, well, it's gone now. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to skip ahead a bit uh, and talk about some of your earlier contributions. This is a strip where you talk about barefoots. Can you talk about the fool? Well, you know, the fool was Birmingham's attempt to have a little underground paper, the way that uh, you have the East Village other uh, in uh, the, uh, the Oracle, in, in various other cities. And uh, it was our little hippie community, uh, which I was very much a part of uh, in 1968, 69, that sort of time period. And uh, so anyway, I, I was happy to, I was happy to find any place where I could get my drawings printed. But it was particularly nice if I could get them printed for an audience that I identified with, like the counterculture community of the Birmingham area. And uh, I did a lot of weird drawings. Interestingly, if you were, I don't know if you could see it from here, but that drawing on the cover is signed Kirk. And the reason is I had a pseudonym for my tribute uh, cartoons was that I was also doing I had an opportunity to do a daily cartoon panel for the uh, mainstream daily newspaper in Birmingham, a little funny animal uh, cartoon panel. Uh, and uh, so I was nervous that my uh, drug humor would KO my 
Main Street and acceptability. So I, for a while, a little while, I had a, this alternate identity, uh, Kirk, but I uh, ultimately became silly and I abandoned that. But if you just see some of my weirder drawings that period, there's some Kirk. So in 1977, you moved to New York. Had you been in New York before then? Yes, uh, I was in New York for a year in 1969, and as many people uh, have heard of my story, I uh, happened to walk up to the Stonewall riots in Congress uh, while tripping on acid. Um, I have a comic strip about that called uh, That Night at the Stonewall that's on my website. And um, anyway, but I had several, it, it was a great time, 69 was a great time to be in New York City. I was right out of college. I had actually gone to grad school at Penn State. I had a playwriting fellowship. But I uh, I really hated grad school. Nothing against Penn State. I was just, I shouldn't have been in grad school. Uh, and I dropped out after one term. And uh, some friends of mine had relocated to New York City, and so I sort of moved in. And we had our little pretty head. And uh, that was the summer of moon landing and the summer of Woodstock and some of the Stonewall riots, and that's what you call a great, great time to be in New York City. And, uh, but I also, I was trying to earn, you know, make it as a freelancer, uh, and uh, I was just too green. I hadn't developed my skills enough, uh, and I was not competitive with the many other uh, excellent uh, cartoonists who were trying to get the same jobs. And so I, I got some, but it was pretty demoralizing, and I couldn't really make enough money to live on, and finally, Went back to Alabama with my tail between my legs like a whipped puppy. And why, why 77? What prompted you to? Well, after seven years uh, living down south, I had gained more confidence. I had begun, I had managed to start having work in underground comic books. I had actually had some people around the country who were becoming aware of my stuff. I had, you know, learned the kind of cartooning chops that you only learn by doing it. Uh, if you look at my funny animal comic strip, Tops and Button, um, you know, about 25% of them are jokes that would not embarrass me now. But the process of having to do one every day uh, really, uh, you know, I, I just learned a huge amount from it. And at the end, underground comic books, I was just a much more competent cartoonist by 1977. And I realized that if I was going to have a cartoon career, it was not going to happen in Alabama. 